thank you all very, very much for coming to this second talk in our series of seven talks throughout the summer on the history of Bristol and of Bristol people and of Midcoast Maine in general. So tonight we're very, very grateful to Michael Decker coming over from Dresden, Maine. Yeah. And uh, Michael grew up here in Maine and has resided in Maine most of his life. Uh, he has a long passion and deep interest in Maine history and especially Midcoast Maine history and especially the Scots-Irish in the Midcoast. Michael has been an author, a teacher, and a living history interpreter as well as a reenactor of Maine's history. And in fact, Michael, every Wednesday and Saturdays, is over at Colonial Pemaquid helping out there. Michael's the author of a book. Uh, he wrote it in 2015, or at least that's when it was published, entitled The French and Indian Wars of Maine. And also, he has just contributed a whole chapter to a brand new book that was published in 2019, entitled Reflections on 300 Years of Scots-Irish in Maine from 1718 to 2018. Michael has also been on the Board of Trustees of Lincoln County Historical Association. So, would you join with me now in giving him a warm welcome? But before you do, I would simply like to say to Michael, that we're very excited about this talk on the Scots-Irish. Uh, we're hoping that you'll be very kind and thoughtful about the Scots-Irish. Because over half of this group here are Scots. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> so welcome. And thank thank you very much. That's a wonderful introduction. <laughs> so you know, Bob said, please be kind in talking about the Scots-Irish. <laughs> Uh, I grew up in Thomaston and in Booth Bay, the very bastions of the Scots-Irish here on the mid-coast, as well as the Pemaquid area. And it really wasn't until about a decade ago uh, that a light went off for me. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with Chip Griffin. Uh, Chip is, he's an attorney over in Booth Bay. And, He's done a lot of writing about the Scots-Irish, and he shared some of his work with me. And I also read uh, Colin Woodard's book, Lobster Coast. And the light bulb that went off was, oh my God, these are the people that I know. These are the communities that I've lived in and grown up with. Now I, I really understand uh, where, where I come from. And my family always said, well, we're Irish. And to a degree, that's true. What my family didn't realize is there are several different kinds of Irish, if you will. They're the Catholic Irish, and part of my family is Duffy. They're the Catholic Irish. But the other side of my family is made up of Knoxes, Cunninghams, and Maclean's. And those are a very different kind of Irish. Those families came from uh, Northern Ireland and they would be considered the Scots-Irish. Now the term Scots-Irish is actually a very recent term. Uh, the people who moved to this area in the wave of migration following 1717, they didn't consider themselves to be Scots-Irish. I think they really considered themselves to be Irish. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more as the talk progresses. So this talk today, while it's about the Scots-Irish, it's also about the final French and Indian War here on the main frontier and the role that the Scots-Irish played in the unfolding of that conflict. Resistance and reprisal, the Scots-Irish of Midcoast Maine during the French and Indian War. The people living here on the mid-coast were engaged in, uh, really, I'm going to say it's, it's a three-way conflict here. Uh, there's conflict with the native people who have resided or had resided in Maine for thousands of years. 
It's a conflict with the government of Massachusetts. And it's a conflict with the representatives of the government of Massachusetts who are living in the midst of the Scots-Irish here in the mid-coast. Now, the Scots-Irish are known for a lot of things, and some of them are wonderful achievements. It, like any culture, I suppose, that uh, the Scots-Irish have their quirks as well. And the Scots-Irish are known for fierce independence. They're known for resisting outside authority. And they're also known for resolving perceived transgressions through violent confrontation. Does this sound familiar at all? I think probably. Uh, now, before we proceed, I want to actually do a little bit of background work. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is the conflicts that ravaged the Maine frontier. Most people don't realize that Maine was a battleground for 80 years. Now, Maine was not always vacation land. Here's Camden Harbor. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? This is not what Maine has always been like. In fact, this is probably a much better representation. Now, this image actually is not from Maine. This is from Acadia, and it was done by an English officer serving in Acadia, Nova Scotia, uh, during the late 1750s. And the war in Acadia is intimately linked to the conflict in Maine. And although this, like I said, this image is of Acadia, it really is evocative of the type of conflict that was going on here on the Maine frontier. These wars, there are six of them in an 80-year period, are particularly savage. And it's not really soldier fighting soldier. Civilians are the primary targets during these conflicts. Communities on both sides are routinely attacked, burned. People are taken captive, they're brought back to Canada. The English are taking Native Americans captive and using them as hostages in negotiation. This is a war in which women and children are routinely killed and scalped. The scalps are sold for gruesome, as gruesome trophies for exorbitant amounts of money, both in Massachusetts and in French Canada. I don't think we can imagine what it must have been like to try and eke out an existence on the main coast during this period. It takes a special kind of person to persevere under those conditions. Now, the other piece I want to talk about is the Scots-Irish themselves. Who are these people? Forgive me if I'm kind of speaking on things that you folks already know, but I think it's important that we really establish this background. So the Scots-Irish. The term Scots speaks to the origins of a lot of these people. Many of these people who move on to Ireland actually came from the lowlands of Scotland and uh, North Britain. And this is a borderland, just like the main frontier is a borderland during the 17th and 18th centuries. This borderland of Scotland and England is rife with violence. There are weak social institutions in the region. There's no centralized authority. Authority is all very local. It's based on clans. This is a region of extreme poverty, a very limited education. It's not a very productive agricultural region. So the Scots, the lowland Scots, have endured centuries of hardship 
in their own homelands. In the early 17th century, Northern Ireland is opened up to these people for colonization. The English have had an Irish problem since the 12th century. And they solved their Irish problem after, oh, 400 years by settling people from the lowlands of Scotland in Northern Ireland. You have essentially absentee landlords who are granted large tracts of land in Ireland who need tenants. And the lowland Scots, they're A, they're perfect tenants, um, and that these are very hardy people. They're used to hardship. They're desperate. And they're more than willing to accept leases under these absentee landlords in Northern Ireland in hopes of bettering themselves and their, their situation. Now, the Irish problem doesn't just go away, though, with colonization. As the lowland Scots are moving into Northern Ireland, they're faced with pushing the native Irish people out. They're displacing the native Irish people. And it's a savage kind of war that's going on throughout Ireland as a result of this colonization. See if this sounds familiar. Communities are burned. It's a war of terror, of murder of women and children. It's being done by both sides, by both the Scots who are moving into to Ireland and the Irish as well. But these lowland Scots persevere. And over the course of the 17th century, they themselves, I think, believe that they're Irish. They don't see themselves as Scots anymore. These are proud Irish. And it's amazing what they accomplish in Northern Ireland. The Presbyterian faith becomes firmly rooted. They establish a very healthy linen manufactory. Their agricultural output is impressive. Things are going well for the people living in Ulster in Northern Ireland. By the end of the 17th century, things begin to change, however. The British Crown begins to institute regulations on the Presbyterian faith. The linen manufactory in Northern Ireland is beginning to compete with English textile interests, and so they begin regulating that industry. There's a series of crop failures due to inclement weather. The long-term leases that these lowland Scots have signed begin to expire, and the English landlords begin to increase rents. Suddenly, these people are feeling an incredible amount of pressure, and they see everything that they've accomplished in Northern Ireland being squeezed. As a result of that, a tremendous number of these former lowland Scots, now Irish, living in Northern Ireland, decide that migration to North America presents a new set of opportunities, and they seize upon it. It's amazing the effect that the migration from Ireland to America has on the communities of Northern Ireland. Entire communities virtually pack up and leave. Now, the first wave of migration begins in 1717. And the Scots-Irish, a lot of them migrate 
to the Appalachian region. They come into Philadelphia and they migrate westward to Virginia, North Carolina, Western Pennsylvania, the Appalachian region. But a second group comes to New England. And when they get to Boston, they find that they're not very welcome. Although they share a similar religious orientation with the Puritans of Massachusetts Bay Colony, the Puritans aren't about to share power with them. And in order to become essentially a voting citizen of Massachusetts at that time, you have to adopt the Puritan faith. Well, the Scots-Irish aren't about to do that. They're not going to give up their Presbyterian beliefs. They're thought to be dirty, uncouth, uneducated. There's a very high degree of literacy in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And this is largely based around the expectation that people are going to be able to read the Bible. The Scots-Irish don't possess the same level of literacy. And as a result of these differences with the Puritans of Massachusetts, they're pushed to the frontier. They're pushed to Maine. They're pushed to New Hampshire. And mind you, this is in the midst of 80 years of war. The borders, the borderlands, Maine, Maine in particular, have been ravaged at this point by a series of three wars, King Philip's War, King William's War, Queen Anne's War. They all sound the same, and basically they're all about the same thing. They're all just continuations of one another. Every once in a while, peace breaks out in Maine, but war is the norm. And when the Scots-Irish move into mid-coast Maine, beginning in 1717, their very presence is going to initiate another round of warfare. I won't get into all the details behind it. Uh, but uh, the fourth of the Indian Wars breaks out as the Scots-Irish are moving into Casco Bay and along uh, the Kennebec region. Unlike in the other conflicts that ravaged the Maine frontier, the Scots-Irish endure. Previously, the, the communities of Maine were abandoned. People fled to Massachusetts. In fact, uh, within a month of the outbreak of King William's War, uh, which features very heavily over here at the Pemaquid uh, historic site, there are only four communities left in Maine, and none of them were east of Wells. So the four communities were Wells, York, Kittery, and the Isle of Shoals. That's the English footprint on the main frontier. And that footprint endures, essentially, until the Scots-Irish arrive about 1720. After this fourth war, Dummer's War, the mid-coast begins to expand. And it's the Scots-Irish who are really fueling this expansion. They move here to Pemaquid under Dunbar. They move into the Booth Bay region in the 16, uh, not six, 1730s as well. They move into the St. George region, what's now Thomaston, Cushing, and Warren. And in fact, a lot of the, the folks who settle in St. George are from the Pemaquid region originally. And they take up tenure of the land uh, from essentially an absentee landlord. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. uh, this guy is Samuel Waldo. And Samuel Waldo is really trying to establish himself as part of the landed gentry of Massachusetts. And so he is encouraging people to move into the St. George region beginning in the 1730s. This is going to be particularly problematic as history progresses. Uh, primarily because this is territory that the native people really felt that they had never given up or relinquished claim to. 
they felt, the native people also felt that they had liberated a lot of their land from the English during King William's War and during Queen Anne's War. And so the Scots-Irish moving into these mid-coast communities only fuels tension between, we'll call them British settlers, because British will encompass English, Scots-Irish. It's, it's increasing tensions with the government of Massachusetts, who is the governing body of the region. And of course, or unfortunately, it's going to create tensions between the native people the, themselves. Uh, unfortunately, throughout this entire period, the native people are very fragmented politically. With the arrival of the Scots-Irish to this area in the 1730s and 1740s, again, there's a renewed round of warfare. And a lot of it doesn't have to, it, it doesn't initiate, or it isn't initiated by settlement of the mid-coast region. It's actually events, in some cases, over in Europe that are spilling over into America. Uh, but ultimately, you know, the region becomes engulfed in war during the 1740s. The Scots-Irish, who have taken up residence here at Pemaquid, in Booth Bay, and at St. George, suffer horribly during, these, during this conflict, as do the native people. You know, the, nobody comes out of these conflicts uh, unscathed. It's, it's horrible, horrible uh, conditions for everybody here on the main frontier. And in the 1740s, the Scots-Irish are on the verge of abandoning the communities again. Uh, things have become so desperate. But they don't. They endure. These are hardy people. Um, war comes to an end in the late 1740s, 1748 to be exact. But this, again, it's only a respite. And now we're going to kind of move into the bulk of this evening's talk. So, the English crown and the French crown, at the end of this conflict in the 1748, uh, in the end of the conflict uh, in 1748, decide that well, we're really going to consolidate our holdings in North America. And the French begin this program of building forts along the waterways of the inland waterways of North America. New France spans from the Gulf of St. Lawrence across the St. Lawrence River to the Great Lakes, down the Mississippi River, and to the Gulf of Mexico. New France is absolutely enormous. But there are only about 70,000 French people living within that entire expanse. So the French begin this program of fort construction. One of the forts that they build is on the forks of the Ohio and the Monongahela. Um, anybody ever heard of a guy by the name of George Washington? Okay. Well, George Washington happens to kick off a world war when he goes to the forks of the Monongahela and the Ohio River to kick the French out of there. And he does this because the English crown has sent directives to all of their colonial governors that they are to kick the French out of English territory with military force if necessary. Well, you know, the, the French think territory is theirs, the English think it's theirs. I think we're going to have some conflict. So George Washington goes to the forks of the Monongahela with a, a military expedition. Now here's what people don't realize. At the same time, the government of Massachusetts is looking at the French and what they're doing here in Maine. And the French have built several forts down east, and there's this rumor of a French fort at the head of the Kennebec River. 
So Massachusetts commissions an army to head up the Kennebec River to kick out the French. Now, George Washington is surrendering to the French in western Pennsylvania after going to kick them out on July 4th of 1755. On July 3rd of 1755, there's an 800-man army moving up the Kennebec River. It's these simultaneous prongs to kick the French out of North America. George Washington happens to trigger a world war. John Winslow, who's leading the expedition up the Kennebec River, finds that there is no French fort. <laughs> but he builds a huge Massachusetts fort in what's today Winslow. It's called Fort Halifax. And this outrages the native people of Maine. But you know, I, I say that, it doesn't outrage all of the native people of Maine. Most of the native people who are living in Maine at this time want nothing more than to simply go on living their lives in peace. They try to seek accommodation with the English. But a lot of Maine's native people, as a result of war, have actually moved out of Maine and they've gone to Canada, to French mission villages. Essentially, they're, they're religious, they're, they're, they're Catholic mission villages. These are, uh, they're headed by the Jesuits. They're refugee communities. But they're also the home of the more militant factions of Maine's native people. And as Fort Halifax is built, within months of that con the construction of the fort, the Maine frontier is subjected to a wave of attacks coming out of French Canada. One of the first communities to be hit is the community at St. George. As a result, Massachusetts declares war on all of Maine's native people, with the exception of the Penobscots. By treaty expectations with the Penobscots, the Penobscots are, Massachusetts expects that the Penobscots are actually going to support them in the war against all these other native people. Not a realistic option. The Penobscot can't do that. And so the Penobscot tried to maintain this policy of neutrality, if you will, with Massachusetts. They provide the government of Massachusetts with intelligence concerning war parties coming out of Canada, and they're giving this intelligence to the Massachusetts military officers who were stationed up at St. George, at Fort, Fort St. George. Uh, the two officers in particular are named uh, Jabez Bradbury and Thomas Fletcher. Now, Jabez Bradbury and Thomas Fletcher, these are Englishmen. Um, Englishmen through and through. These aren't Scots-Irish. These are the representatives of Massachusetts living in the mix of the Scots-Irish community at St. George. Um, but culturally, they're very different. And they're treated with suspicion by the residents of St. George. Immediately following Massachusetts' declaration of war against all of the native people, with the exception of the Penobscots, in June of 1755, a large party of Penobscot delegates come into the fort at St. George uh, to negotiate peace, essentially, and deliver a, a message of, of peace to the governor of Massachusetts. Now, we have to remember that the residents of St. George, these Scots-Irish residents, have experienced several waves of warfare over the past several decades. Their homes have been burned, destroyed. Their community has been attacked within the past month. I think we can imagine what they must be feeling. I'm sure there's fear, there's anger, Unfortunately, the Scots-Irish residents of the Midcoast region 
fail to distinguish between hostile and neutralist factions of the native people. And they seize this delegation and hold them hostage. The representatives of the Massachusetts government at St. George are left speechless by this. Um, and in fact, the, the community rises up in arms and the, the, the fort's garrison as well rises up in arms to take these people hostage. And basically they say, we're not letting them go until we get satisfaction for this last round of attacks. This is at a time where Massachusetts is doing their best to keep the main frontier from exploding in another round of violence, although they've declared war on the other people of the re other native people of the region. It's somewhat of a hollow declaration of war because the Penobscots are about the only native people left. Um, Massachusetts is in, a, is in a position where they've already spent huge amounts of money fighting wars on the main frontier. They can't afford to do this again. They're at war with the French. The entire North American conf uh, continent is going up in flames. And so Massachusetts does not want another war on the main frontier. Bradbury and Fletcher as the representatives of Massachusetts do their best to calm the situation. They come to an arrangement where the Scots-Irish residents of St. George agreed to let most of the delegates go, but they send three of these men hostage to Massachusetts. Massachusetts at this time is trying to negotiate with the Penobscots, trying to seek some sort of a peaceful arrangement on the main frontier. But all this goes to nothing in early July of 1755, when a group of men from this area, Newcastle in particular, uh, anybody ever hear of James Cargill? Are the Car do the Cargills still live in the area? I know it was quite a name for some time. Okay, I'll be careful what I say then. <laughs> James Cargill, here's He's, he's the very, I'm going to say right now, he's the very embodiment of the Scots-Irish on the main coast. Like the, the inhabitants of St. George, Cargill refuses to see the distinction between hostile and accommodationist factions amongst the native people. And he raises a posse, I'm not going to call them anything but a posse, of men from Newcastle, Damascata, Waldeboro, St. George. And they march across, or they, they cross the St. George River. Now the St. George River is the boundary line between the native world and the English world in 1755. And he marches these men over into South Thomason. And first they encounter a band of a native band of three people somewhere over in uh, South Thomas. I'm thinking it's probably over in the gig area if anybody's familiar with St. Uh, South Thomaston at all. Now, Massachusetts is not at war with the Penobscots, but he falls on this Penobscot band or his, his posse falls on this Penobscot band. And it's a woman. Her name is Margaret Moxa. And Margaret Moxa is a well-known woman in the area, native woman in the area. She's frequently been into the fort. She's probably one of the people who's supplying Bradbury and Fletcher with intelligence about Penobscot intentions, about war parties coming down out of Canada. She has with her her husband and her infant son. The party murders and scalps all three of them. And the story goes that as they're murdering the small child, the statement is made, all nits become lice. Unfortunately, this is the way war is conducted on the main frontier. 
Unfortunately, this atrocity is being committed against innocent people with whom Massachusetts is not at war. But the killing doesn't stop there. Cargill and his men go on to uh, Owl's Head, where they murder another nine people, another nine Penobscots, take their scalps, and the next day they march into Saint, the fort at St. George, carrying 12 scalps of the native people. Now, under most circumstances, these scalps are worth money. Massachusetts pays bounties on native scalps. Doesn't matter if it's a man, a woman, or a child. You get more money if it's a man, but you still get good money for the scalp of a woman or a child. And it's big money. Uh, it's, it's almost equivalent to a year's wages for somebody working. Uh huh. So you can imagine this party of men, go, they go out on a scalp hunting expedition. They come in with 13 scalps. They figure, well, we'll cash these in. Um, they, you know, what they claim, uh, yeah. we'll cash these in, we'll make some good money. Well, they bring them in and Jabez Bradbury and Thomas Fletcher arrest them and send them down to Massachusetts to stand trial for murder. How do you think that goes? Nah, they're acquitted. But not right away. As a result of this, Massachusetts tries to curtail the operation of these scalp hunting parties by prohibiting the operation of any military activity essentially in the, the Penobscot Bay region. Um, at the same time, they're, they're, Massachusetts is trying to make amends with the Penobscot people, giving them gifts, saying we're sorry, continuing to negotiate. But at the same time, they're still saying to the Penobscots, you need to supply us with warriors for our war against Maine's other native people. And on top of that, you need to move out of your homelands and live amongst us. Now the Penobscots know, A, they can't provide warriors to fight Maine's other native people. It would mean a civil war amongst the native people here in Maine. Because although these people, we consider them Penobscots, there's been an incredible mixing of groups as a result of war and disease on the Maine frontier. And so there are people from the Kennebec residing with the Penobscot. There are people from the St. John region further down east who we would consider the Passamaquoddy today residing with the, the people at Penobscot. They're all interrelated by this point. These negotiations go on for some time. The Scots-Irish who were living at St. George and here at Pemaquid are becoming increasingly frustrated because there continue to be raids against the communities here of the Maine coast. And in fact, in September of 1755, the community at St. George is attacked again. And at this time, Thomas Fletcher is in charge of the garrison. Jabez Bradbury is in Boston conferring with the governor. And Bradbury doesn't send the garrison of the fort out. He doesn't send out the, what's called the scouting, well, the scouting company, which is these volunteers who are patrolling, looking for signs of, of native war parties. They're actually out on the march at this point when the community is attacked. And it doesn't seem like a lot of damage is done, but the native people certainly kill a lot of cattle. And while that doesn't seem to be a big deal, the destruction of a community's cattle herd may mean starvation over the winter. It also often is seen as a warning by the native people. Okay, we've killed your cattle. 
Next time it's going to be something more. So the people at St. George are outraged. And at this point, you really see the conflict between Massachusetts and the people at St. George come to the boiling point. Because these people feel like Massachusetts has been restraining them this whole time while the native people are attacking their communities. The government of Massachusetts is saying we can't do anything about it. We can't march against the native people of Maine. They're holding us back. The native people of Maine are all in that region where you're prohibiting us from conducting military operations. The native people, they attack our community and you do nothing. You keep the soldiers within the fort and watch as this happens. And so they begin to accuse not only Massachusetts of not doing anything, but they begin to accuse Jabez Bradbury and Thomas Fletcher of complicity with the native people. And this is nothing new. You see, Jabez Bradbury and Thomas Fletcher have always had phenomenal relations with the native people. Jabez Bradbury is not just a military commander. He's been in charge of the negotiations between the Penobscot and Massachusetts all along. He has been in charge of the trade between Massachusetts and the Penobscot people, which is vital to the survival of the native people. They've become dependent upon European trade goods. The, the native people hold Bradbury and Fletcher in high esteem. And so the people of St. George begin to file complaints with the government of Massachusetts about Bradbury and about Fletcher. They're trying to kick them out of the region, have them removed from command. There's another native delegation that comes in in the fall of 1755 to conduct negotiations uh, to try and maintain peace on the main frontier yet again. Anybody want to venture a guess what happens? They take this delegation hostage as well. So when Massachusetts finally becomes frustrated with the Penobscot for not responding to their calls for, for warriors and for the Penobscot to come and live amongst them at St. George and at Pemaquid. Um, they're left with no other option but to declare war on the Penobscot finally. And this removes the final barrier to unrestrained whoop, warfare here on the... <laughs> Here on the main frontier. Now here, this is the final declaration of war against the native people of Maine. And in this case, it's, it's the Penobscot. And I know it's very hard to read, but I'm going to read something to you here. This is issued in November of 1755. After two negotiating parties from the Penobscot have been seized by the community at St. George, after James Cargill and his band have gone out and committed atrocities against the Penobscot people. This is after months of Massachusetts demanding that the Penobscot support them militarily and that they come and live with the English to give up their homelands, to abandon their autonomy, their own sovereignty, and live with the Scots-Irish, who refused to distinguish hostile versus non-hostile native people. And I'm going to read something to you. This is a declaration by Spencer Phipps. He's lieutenant governor of Massachusetts, but he's the acting governor at the time. Um, William Shirley has been recalled to England by this time, and uh, Spencer Phipps is really running the show. And this proclamation says, I do hereby require His Majesty's subjects of this province to embrace all opportunities of pursuing, captivating, killing, and destroying all and every of the aforesaid Indians. Let that sink in for a minute. This has become a policy of genocide by 1755, 
Here you have Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts requiring the people living on the main frontier to pursue, captivate, kill, and destroy all and every of the aforesaid Indians. It goes on to list all the scalp and captive bounties that people can expect to cash in on with the taking of native people. Um, you know, so a, a male Indian, or a, <laughs> Indian native person, uh, above the age of 12 years, take their scalp, it's worth 50 pounds. Again, that's a year's wages. If you take them captive and bring them back to Massachusetts, woo, they're worth a little more money because then we can use them as bargaining chips in our leveraging with the, the native people of Maine. This war goes on for another four years. This document removes any restraints on war, on scalp hunters on the main frontier for the next uh, four years, approximately. James Cargill, who was arrested for the murder of these native people in July of 1755, by 1756, he's back on the main frontier. He's been found not guilty by a jury of his peers. And James Cargill goes on to be a prolific scalp hunter on the main frontier. But he's not the only one. In fact, uh, this becomes such big business that essentially there are joint stock companies that outfit schooners from Falmouth, Portland. And these schooners range the main coast taking scalps. And so people pay in to outfit these ships because it's expensive. And then they're expecting their payout when the scalps are brought back in and, and sold to the, the government of Massachusetts. And uh, one of the reasons that we know this is that one of the ministers, I, I believe it was Smith, down in Falmouth is writing in his journal, boy, I can't wait to reap the rewards of that scalp money. I've got a lot of money coming to me. This is the nature of war on the main frontier. And unfortunately, by 1759, the native people of Maine are absolutely vanquished. They're destroyed by war, by disease. Uh, you know, I can't emphasize enough the effect of disease on the native people. And that disease is, you know, a lot of it, uh, unfortunately, is the result of hardship of, of the war. Uh, malnutrition, because as these scalp hunters are ranging the coast, they're not allowing the, peop the native people to harvest their traditional resources on the shore for food. They're burning crops. They're keeping the native people on a cons on constantly on the move. Smallpox breaks out amongst the native people. A lot of the Penobscot, or not a lot, some of the Penobscots had actually gone off to fight in upstate New York and participated in the attack against Fort William Henry. If anybody's ever seen the movie Last of the Mohicans, it's kind of that story. Um, but when they come back, they bring smallpox with them. And by 1757, uh, you know, the native people are just, they're spent and they, again, they're seeking accommodation with the government of Massachusetts. Uh, Jabez Bradbury still in command up at St. George, despite the best efforts of the Scots-Irish population there. And he inquires of 21 native people with whom he's had regular contact with over the years. And the native people report that 14 of those people have died of smallpox. So it gives you a sense of the degree of mortality that the native people are experiencing as a result of disease during this period. This is probably the darkest chapter in Maine's history. I think it's probably one of the least talked about chapters in Maine history. 
Um, I think in a lot of respects, we'd like to forget this. Um, but I'll leave you with this anecdote. Um, a few years back when I first wrote my book, I gave a talk at the Maine Historical Society about it. And they put me in this room, it was an auditorium, and I got there early, because I always have technology trouble. And I, so I spent some time just looking around, and on some of the walls, there were these photographs of current Maine artists engaging in traditional native crafts. These are native craftspeople performing work in basketry, ceramics, uh, the building of birch bark canoes. Beautiful work, which shows the vitality of the native culture here in Maine today. There's, there's been a resurgence in people's pride in their native heritage. In another corner of the room, there was a movie playing. And the movie was about the forced removal of native children from their families to be placed in white boarding schools, such as the Carlisle School, or placed with white foster families for no, well, I'm sure that those people who were removing this fam these children thought that they were doing what was best for the children. But the net effect was destruction of native families and native culture. Again, speaking to that genocide of Maine's native people. And what really struck me was obviously a school group had come through this room fairly recently because on the board there was a question. And the question was, are there native people in Maine today? And if so, where are they? And there were two answers on the board. And it was clearly written by two different children. Um, either that or it was an adult with atrocious handwriting. I don't, um, but the first answer was, they're all gone. They were all killed off. The second answer was, yes, they're here and they're everywhere. And I think there's incredible poignancy to both of those answers. So, now that I've given you that nice uplifting yeah. talk about our Scots-Irish ancestors and, and the horrible things that were done here on the main frontier, I'd love to hear from you, and I'd love to answer any questions that you may have. Yes. Was the French involved at all uh, in 1755 or, or in Maine during that, or, or any time during that war? They were to a limited degree. Uh, in 1758, the largest attack against the communities of Maine, the mid coast, uh, actually, it's. Uh, conducted by a number of Frenchmen who are coming out of Nova Scotia. And along the way, they're recruiting native allies. And there's a force of about 400 uh, natives and French who come down the coast of Maine, Penobscot Bay. And first they attack the fort at St. George and they lay siege there for a couple of days. The siege is broken when Massachusetts is able to send a couple of warships up the river. Um, and at that point, the war party breaks up and they begin raiding uh, down the coast. They, they hit the Waldeboro area. There are some attacks here at Pemaquid. Um, and there, there is French involvement in that. James Cargill, in one of his journals of his scalp hunting activities, actually reports seeing Frenchmen in the woods uh, when he takes a couple of native scalps. So I think it's limited participation. I don't, they're not French regulars. I think they're probably more French partisans because at the same time, the British are trying to push the, uh, the Acadians out of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, 
And so I think they're forming guerrilla bands and attacking English targets, both in Acadia and also in Maine. Because I really, I really believe that you can't separate the war in Acadia from the war in Maine. I think that they're really intimately tied together. It's kind of this war for the Gulf of Maine, if you will. Michael, thank you very well, much. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you.